Just to let you know, we will be recording this session today, so it'll be available then on our website afterwards, and we'll send you the link um, to be able to join. I think we're just waiting for a few more people to come in. Okay, I think that seems to be most people for now, so we'll, we'll get started. Um, so I'm Sarah Kyo, I'm the dietitian with the Celiac Society, and I'm delighted today to talk to you about the, the topic of myths of celiac disease. And I suppose this topic is aimed both at people who have celiac disease, but I find most of you probably know some of these anyway, but also for people who think they might be celiac or people who think they might have a family member or they're not sure what the symptoms might be or how to get tested. So we're going to go through all of that today. And um, we will have time for questions at the end. And if you have any um, questions as we go along, please feel free to pop them up into the chat. Keep an eye on the chat. We'll be running a poll just to get some, uh, some I'm gonna ask you a few questions about halfway through and I'll let you know when, when we run that. Um, as, as we're waiting, just to say thank you very much to Shar, who's sponsoring this session for us. And they are going to give anyone who attends a four euro voucher to spend on um, gluten-free Shar products. Um, another um, thing just to mention is that the CEAC Society have been running an appeal for Ukraine. And we just started it there yesterday and we have just under 10,000 euros raised from members of the CEAC Society so far, which is just a fantastic, um, really just amazing from our members to do that so if you want to get involved it's on our facebook page and on linkedin or you can ring the celiac office on the main number and um, if you want to donate to that appeal as well okay i think we really have plenty of people still joining um give them one more minute and then we'll, we'll get started i'm going to pop up the slides um and we will we'll kind of go from there so So when we talk about myths of celiac disease, um, I suppose we've run this um, before, kind of got a good while ago, um, and it was so interesting the, the response that we got from people for it because there's so many myths out there about it. And as I said, even sometimes people who've had celiac disease for years um, will still learn some new things. So since I know we have lots of people joining who may not actually have celiac disease, I'm just gonna run through um, a little bit about what celiac disease is. So it's an autoimmune disease. Sometimes people think of it as an allergy or a food intolerance. Um, strangely, it's neither. Um, it's an autoimmune disease. And autoimmune means it's a disease where the body attacks itself. So in this case, with celiac disease, the body is attacking its own um, gut and gut lining. But it does this in response to gluten. So it's, it's an interesting autoimmune disease that in that if we actually take gluten out, um, the body stops attacking itself. If you put gluten back in, the body starts attacking itself again. So we talk about it as an abnormal response to gluten and it affects in Ireland an estimated one in 100 people. Um, but once you get into families, that really takes a jump and it affects then one in 10 people within families. And that's when we look at studies, sort of international studies, where they would say, you know, when we've tested this one in 10 and family members. But I've been running um, a clinic in, for celiac disease with the Celiac Society for three years now. And we are really seeing maybe closer to 50% when people actually go out and get tested. So it's important that if someone in your family has celiac disease that you do actually get tested as well because it does turn up more often in families. So it mainly affects the gut, um, but it can affect lots of other parts. And that's the first myth of celiac disease is the idea that celiac disease only affects the gut. But we know that celiac disease affects the bones, that people with celiac disease are much more likely to develop osteoporosis, they're more likely to have osteopenia. Um, in children, maybe they don't get enough nutrition for the bones to grow and to put down the sort of bone density that they need. We know that celiac disease affects fertility. So for both men and women, it's a lot more difficult um, to become pregnant um, or to father a baby. Um, if, you are on, if you're celiac and undiagnosed, and the beauty about the fertility is that once someone is on a gluten free diet within two years um, and often quite sooner, but usually within two years, um, fertility comes back to normal. For women with undiagnosed celiac disease, they are unfortunately more likely to have repeated miscarriages. And there's also an increased risk of having a stillborn baby. We see skin being affected. There's rashes that you can get. The nervous system can be affected and hair. Um, a lot of people will see hair loss with celiac disease. So it's not just a disease that affects the gut. It really has an effect right through the whole body. Some of the gut symptoms of celiac disease and um, things like diarrhea, bloating, constipation, abdominal pain, 
Um, not everybody gets these and some people might have diarrhea, some people might get constipation, bloating may or may not be there, it often is, but not always. Stomach pain could be just the big sign for a lot of people, but also indigestion, heartburn, um, that's quite common. A lot of belching, actually, people would say really before they were diagnosed, they would have had a lot of belching and that's quite common as well. People might feel sick, they might have nausea. They can be lactose intolerant and that's really important to note that if you are lactose intolerant it's very important to check that you're not celiac as well because about 20 percent of people with lactose intolerance will actually turn out to be celiac so really important to get that one checked some people will see weight loss as well although we don't see that as much these days and you're just as likely to be diagnosed at a healthy weight or overweight um, with celiac disease as you are being underweight the important thing and you'll see here is that gut symptoms are experienced by 60% of people with celiac disease, which means that about 40% of people with celiac disease don't have any gut symptoms at all. So, you know, you can have celiac disease even if your gut seems to be perfectly normal. You're not having any diarrhea or bloating or pain or anything like that. So it's one of those things. Sometimes people don't think about um, celiac disease as an issue because their tummy actually seems to be fine. When we look at the nervous system, we know that um, if you're celiac and you eat gluten, it can have quite an impact on your nerves. So we see higher rates of anxiety and depression. Now, some of that can be due to the nervous system, and sometimes it can be due to malabsorption of B vitamins, um, which is actually quite common. We see a lot of headaches and migraines. So around 25% of people with celiac disease will report severe headaches um, when they're diagnosed, which then go away. So if you do get repeated severe headaches or you get migraine, um, it's actually worth having a celiac test just to see if that might be the issue. So tiredness and exhaustion. So this whole tired all the time kind of feeling um, would be quite common. Brain fog, where if someone eats gluten, they're just cloudy, can't think very well. They might feel sleepy very quickly and um, not able to concentrate. But actually, it can also affect balance and can cause numbness, can cause pins and needles kind of feeling in the fingers um, and ataxia, which is problems with coordination. And there's sort of a, a separate heading for the celiac disease, which is sometimes called gluten ataxia, which is where gluten is causing this damage to the nervous system. But it's all part of celiac disease. And we know that one in five people with celiac disease will have these neurological, these nervous system symptoms. So again, now there's lots of other things that can cause this. So this is one of the problems is that, you know, all of these could be caused by something else. Um, but if you're ticking a few boxes here, and particularly if there's any kind of tummy issue, it probably is worth getting your celiac disease checked. What we also see um, quite often with celiac disease, but definitely not always, would be anemia and low iron. So we see vitamin and mineral deficiencies. So it's, it's not unusual for someone with celiac disease when they're diagnosed to be low in iron, to be low in B12 or low in vitamin D or low in folic acid. So if you ever have a blood test and these are low and there's no other explanation in the sense that, you know, you haven't had, I don't know, big car accident and lost a lot of blood, things like that, you know, or you're, you're on a very restricted diet. And um, if there's no other explanation for it, I would have a celiac test. And if you've had a few blood tests where these are low, definitely tick the box for a celiac test and just check and see what might be going on there. Um, celiac disease also affects skin and teeth. These are some lovely pictures here of a skin rash called dermatitis herpetiformis, which is um, affects about 10% of people with celiac disease. Um, and what we'd see is people have this rash for maybe 10 years before they finally have a test for celiac disease. And it turns out, oh, this horrible itchy rash that I've had forever um, can be fixed by a gluten-free diet. So it's a rash that comes up as a little white blister, but it is incredibly itchy. And we had a great dermatologist speaking to us a few months ago, and she was saying that in her experience, it's the itchiest of any of the skin rashes that are out there. So because they're so, it's so itchy, everybody scratches them. So you get these kind of, it looks more like a scabby kind of a rash on the arms. So with dermatitis herpetiformis, it typically shows up on the outside of the elbows, on the outside of the knees. And this would be different to something like eczema. Eczema tends to come into the folds on the inside of the elbow or the folds of skin on the inside of the knees, whereas dermatitis herpetiformis tends to be on the outside. And it's often usually both sides. So if someone has it, they'll have on the front of both of their elbows or on the front of both of their knees. Now it can turn up all over the body, but it's, it's interesting if you particularly have it on the outside of both elbows and um, this itchy scratchy rash that looks like this and um, definitely get your celiac check. But it also celiac disease causes mouth ulcers. So lots of people with celiac disease will actually be picked up by their dentist because their dentist is, has them in and they're having these mouth ulcers. And um, actually, it's something if you do get repeated mouth ulcers, definitely celiac test, but also poor tooth enamel. 
Um, so obviously we need good nutrition to build healthy teeth. So if someone has celiac disease and they're not absorbing and their nutrients as they should, it can really affect tooth enamel, especially if their vitamin D or calcium levels are low. So you might see this where children, when their adult teeth come in, the enamel is quite poor. So again, if that happens, don't immediately think that it might be sugar or things like that. Um, you know, it could be, but it's, you know, it's definitely one of kids when the new teeth come up, if the enamel is weak or there's a problem with it, um, definitely time to check for celiac disease. So in children, the symptoms can be a little bit different. Um, so we, uh, we see weight loss a little more often with children, but definitely not every child. So don't be waiting for them to lose weight. Usually by the time they're losing weight, the disease has kind of progressed quite a bit, but we do see slower growth. Now children are being caught a lot earlier these days than they would have been years ago, but it's quite normal these days to meet adults with celiac disease who would have had it, but not picked up in childhood. But then that's where you see people who are four foot 11, five foot, five foot one, that, you know, that kind of sort of that on the low level in terms of height. And actually there's, there's a bit of a discussion now about whether or not everyone under five foot four should actually be checked for celiac disease because it does slow down growth um, in children. And now a lot of children will catch up once they're diagnosed, but if you've kind of got into adulthood without being picked up, um, actually that doesn't, that height doesn't recover for them. So I said poor tooth enamel turns up in children, mouth ulcers, but tired and low energy. You know, kids naturally have a certain amount of energy, you know, desire to be running around and doing things and getting involved. And if you have a child who's kind of just that bit more tired, less involved, not doing a whole lot. Again, it's, it's worth kind of just asking that question. You'll sometimes see them as fussy eaters, but what's really interesting is that if you have a celiac child who's a fussy eater, and if they're undiagnosed, what they're fussy about is foods with gluten in them. So we'd see this where I, I'd work a lot with fussy eaters, and if someone comes into me and they're saying, well, you know, they eat fruit and veg, but they won't eat pasta or bread, you're like, that's a big red flag, that the child is, has learned that these foods make them feel unwell, and so they refuse to eat them. So that kind of fussy eater where it's like bread, pasta, all those kind of things, if that's what the child's avoiding, again, we're looking for a celiac test. We might see children being more anxious. What sometimes happens there though, you know, if you have a child who's a pain in their tummy and they're anxious, people will assume maybe there's a bit of bullying in school or they're anxious about school and they're more likely to get sent, particularly girls, are more likely to get sent to see like a psychologist or a play therapist rather than having a check um, for celiac disease. So kids can absolutely be worried about things. They can absolutely get, you know, ask any, any GP, they'll tell you, look, pain in a stomach is just very common in kids and can usually be nothing. Um, but again, if it's going on, and especially if the child is a bit tired, and especially if there's anything funny going on when they go to the loo, and um, if they're having a bit of diarrhea or they're having really bad constipation, Again, no harm just to have that blood test done and check for celiac disease. One of the other things is that celiac disease links in with a lot of other conditions. So we know that um, osteoporosis and celiac disease are closely linked. So especially if, you, if you're diagnosed with osteoporosis at quite a young age, so someone in their 30s, 40s, 50s is being diagnosed with osteoporosis, again, we need to look at a celiac test for that. We see more arthritis in people with celiac disease, more infertility, as we mentioned. Um, but people with type 1 diabetes are more likely to have celiac disease. Um, about 12% of people with type 1 diabetes will also have celiac disease. People with Down syndrome and Turner syndrome, um, where we know that sort of about 1% of the general population is celiac. If someone has Down syndrome or Turner syndrome, they're more around 6% of them will have celiac disease as well. Um, celiac disease is closely linked with underactive thyroid as well. So any thyroid disease um, is, is linked, not always, I mean, it's, but there's an association with them. And around 12% of people with celiac disease will also have an underactive thyroid and vice versa. So if you have been diagnosed with an underactive thyroid, you should always have a check for celiac disease at the same time. In children, we can see delayed puberty. Um, girls, for example, having their periods much later. So coming into age 15, 16 and still no periods again. I mean, there's lots of things that can cause that. But say for boys, if puberty hasn't happened um, either, you know, just normal development, just again, to check out for celiac disease. In women, undiagnosed celiac disease is linked with an early menopause as well. And obviously that has significant impacts on women's health um, as they get older, if they have heard early menopause. And as I mentioned, hair loss, which is probably one of the most distressing side effects with this um, for a lot of people is, is the hair loss. So myth number two, if you think you might be celiac after I've gone through all of those um, symptoms, should you trial a gluten-free diet? And that is a very hard and definite no. The reason for that is that if you go on a gluten-free diet and then you feel fantastic and you think, hmm, I better go and get checked for celiac, because you're on a gluten-free diet, your blood test, your biopsy, they will all come back negative even if you are celiac. 
So bear in mind, cutting out gluten fixes celiac disease. So if you cut it out and get tested, it's not going to work. So the most important thing, if you think you might have celiac disease is keep eating gluten, go and get your G, go and see your GP for your celiac blood test. And if your blood test comes back positive, you have to keep eating gluten until you've had your biopsy. And this seems so counterintuitive when I say this to people. Um, so it seems so counterintuitive um, for people with that because um, it seems like you should just immediately stop eating gluten, but it's very, very important to get um, the full um, testing done properly while you're still eating gluten. So between, um, so the next one is a negative blood test means you're not celiac. So this is, this is one that turns up quite a bit. So a blood test for celiac disease is a screen for celiac disease. It is, doesn't diagnose for most people. OK, so a blood test lets your doctor know that you might have celiac disease. Um, but the problem is that even if it's negative, it doesn't necessarily mean you're not celiac, because we know that between three and 10 percent of people with celiac disease will have a negative blood test. So we would see that quite a bit in clinic. And usually if one family member is negative on a blood test, but positive on biopsy, then everyone in their family will have the same sort of um, signs that the, the family members will be negative on a blood test, but positive on a biopsy. So even if you have a celiac test, blood test, and it's negative, if you're still having gut symptoms, you know, and you think it might be celiac disease, it, you might need to go ahead and have the biopsy anyway. Um, but keep eating gluten, as I said, keep, keep that going. So myth number four with celiac disease is that food intolerance tests are useful. So food intolerance tests are very different to the tests that you would have with your GP. When your GP checks, they're validated tests, they're tests that have a lot of science behind them, and they will give you some really good results. Food intolerance tests are tests that you wouldn't, your doctor won't be running. You won't get those with the doctor. Um, they're often, we might see them, what people might describe maybe as alternative practitioners would tend to do them. And the problem with them is, is that they're very heavily marketed. I see them advertised on loads of websites, but none of them do diagnose or rule out celiac disease. In fact, they don't actually diagnose any food intolerance at all. Um, when we look at things like IgG testing, which is a blood test, uh, which is often sent away to a lab, and you come back with a sort of a list of foods in sort of the, the red section that you're meant to avoid, and the amber section, which is middle of the road, and the green section, which is safe. Um, the HPRA in Ireland, which is the Health Products Regulatory Authority in Ireland, um, they had a statement out a few years ago saying that they've examined and studied these and they do not diagnose food intolerance, which can be very misleading because lots of people have these done and spend a lot of money on them because they think they'll diagnose it. What the IgG, IgG tests actually tell you is what you ate recently. That's all they are. They're a document of what you ate recently. So to be honest, save your money um, with them. Um, the problem is what I'd see in the clinic is lots of people with celiac disease have had these tests done and gluten didn't show up as a food. So they think, oh, well, if gluten didn't show up in this food, I mustn't be celiac. But as I said, these tests, they don't really tell you anything. So a lot of people, it delays their diagnosis when they've gone for food intolerance tests instead of getting properly diagnosed with it. So if you think celiac disease is in there at all, you need to see your GP for a celiac test. Because again, these sort of, I, I, they're called food intolerance tests. <laughs> None of them actually test for food intolerance. Um, but these tests, they won't rule out celiac disease for you either. Um, so they, they can be very confusing. So if you think there's anything wrong with your gut, really important to see your GP, really important to get your celiac test done. So myth number five. So myth number five is that you can be diagnosed with just a blood test. Now, it's different for adults and children. So that's why there's lots of confusion with this one. So in children, if a child has a blood test and the blood test result is more than 10 times above normal, and they have symptoms of celiac disease, a pediatric gastroenterologist, nobody else, can diagnose the children with celiac disease. However, if the child's blood test is below 10 times limit, they will need the biopsy to be done. For adults, um, the guidelines are that adults should have both a blood test and a biopsy, no matter what the level is. Now, there is confusion about this recently because in the UK, because of COVID and delays getting the endoscopy, getting the biopsies done, um, they put in a temporary guideline where they said that if adults had the very high level of a blood test, they were going to diagnose them with celiac disease. Um, there's a lot of controversy about that in the UK. It is the guidance that's there at the moment. 
the reason that we really push for adults to have the biopsy is because between five and 10% of adults with a positive celiac blood test will turn out to be negative on the biopsy. So the problem there is that you will have between five and 10% of people starting a strict gluten-free diet and a whole life of gluten-free who actually don't need it. So, you know, the diet is complicated enough. It's tricky enough. If you don't have to be on it, um, you know, there's no point. So in Ireland, the recommendation is still that adults need both a blood test and a biopsy. And so as I said, for children who are attending a gastroenterologist at a hospital, the gastroenterologist will use their expertise and may decide your child can be diagnosed without um, necessarily having the biopsy. But really important not to think that the blood test on its own is enough. And remember, if you're an adult, once you've had your blood test, or if you're a child who's going to be going to get a biopsy, you must keep eating gluten until you've had your test. So don't be tempted to stop. If you do cut out gluten before a test, you have to be eating gluten for six weeks before you have your test again. So we talk, call that the gluten challenge. So it needs to be six weeks of eating gluten. Um, so the trouble is for a lot of people is when they come off the gluten, they feel so great that it's very difficult to go back on. So it often means lots of people don't get the proper di um, diagnosis, which also means they don't get the proper follow-up care. So if you're not diagnosed with celiac disease, you're less likely then to go on to get your DEXA scan, to get to see your dietitian, to have be tracked for your nutrients and things like that. It is important to actually get your diagnosis. So if you, if you can hang on, and I know it can be difficult, but try and get keep the gluten going until you have your test. So myth number six is that a gluten-free diet is easy and you don't need a dietitian. Um, obviously, I'm a bit biased on this one being a dietitian myself, but we've had so many people in the celiac society over the years who, when they're diagnosed, are told, look it up online or they're given sort of a one page of foods. And the research showed us very clearly that over 60% of people, and in some research up to 80% of people who didn't see a dietitian um, are still eating gluten years later. And I have to say that is my experience at the clinic in the Celiac Society. When I meet people who've never seen a dietitian, almost always we will find they are eating gluten somewhere. I mean, it's, it's very easy to sort of go, well, I'll, I'll have the gluten-free bread and the gluten-free pasta. And those things are the easy bit of it. Um, the difficult bit is the cross-contamination. It's knowing that you need to use your food list. It's looking you know, like how to actually read labels and how reliable they are and are not. Um, but also celiac disease is not just about being gluten-free. There's other nutrients. We know that people with celiac disease are lower in B12, iron, folic acid, zinc, B vitamins. We know that fiber can be a huge issue. We know that they can have issues around cholesterol. There's often problems around liver function tests. So there's a whole broad diet um, and dietary advice with it. And it's not that someone needs to be sitting with a dietitian, you know, every week, but definitely on diagnosis, see a dietitian. And I mean, the official guidelines are once a year, but you know, once you're very well established, even popping back in, you know, every two to three years, even just to have a checkup and check what your diet is doing, make sure you've had your blood test and that everything is okay. Um, I mean, what I find a lot is people who never saw a dietitian kind of are a bit better after they've started gluten free diet, but they never get their gut fully back to normal. Um, and often it's just a few small changes with someone kind of who's experienced can make a huge, huge difference um, with that. So really important to get your GP to refer you to a dietitian. There's the HSE community dietitians and your GP can refer you. And they're going to be free of charge and you can access there and um, there's dietitians who work privately so make sure you go to a core registered dietitian or we have the clinic at the celiac society and we do face-to-face -face clinics at our office in clondalkin and we also do online appointments and um, so do make sure if you've never seen a dietitian or it's been a long time since you've seen your dietitian no harm just to have that checkup for yourself and make sure you're okay with it so one of the big myths is the idea that a little gluten won't do any harm. And this is where you might have, um, and I'm not even going to be mean to grandparents, but occasionally grandparents go, well, can I not just have one biscuit or a little bit will be fine. And the trouble is, no, um, gluten, even very, very tiny amounts of gluten can actually cause, will, will actually cause it, trigger the celiac disease. So it's the amount of, you can imagine a pin, it's the amount of gluten that would fit on the very, very tip of a pin is enough to trigger the full celiac reaction in people. And this is, if you remember doing fractions at school um, and you remember doing your half and your, your half and your quarter, well, if 20 millionths of the food has gluten in it, that is enough to trigger the celiac reaction. So really a tiny bit does do harm. The big confusion here is that, um, you know, some people have instant reactions to gluten and some don't. So sometimes people think that, oh, well, maybe I'm not that celiac, but actually you are. Um, so everybody does need to mind their gluten. 
One of the big myths is the idea that you grow out of celiac disease. Now, thankfully, that one does seem to be slowly going away, but I still meet people today who think that they have grown out of their celiac disease. You don't. It used to be thought that people grew out of it um, because what you tend to see, you're more likely in children to see kind of diarrhea, um, re, you know, stomach pain. And particularly years ago, children would, when they were turning up with celiac disease, they were underweight, they were diarrhea, they were really quite sick. But we know as people get older, that can shift a little bit and the diarrhea might not be so bad. Um, there's also a change in hormones around puberty that temporarily makes the body slightly less sensitive to gluten. So sometimes the reactions are not as severe in puberty as they would have been for children. So that was where the idea that children grow out of it came from. But we know now that's not true at all, unfortunately. It'd be great if it was, but you don't grow out of celiac disease. So if you were ever diagnosed with celiac disease, even as a child, um, and you're thinking, oh, you know, I grew out of it, maybe just pop back in and, and check with your doctor um, with that, because particularly in terms of thinking of your bones later on, really important just to get that one um, sorted out. Can you be slightly celiac? So this comes back to what I was starting to talk about in the in the last one was that about 40 percent of people with celiac disease will feel very sick when they eat gluten. So those 40 percent of people will have vomiting, diarrhea, stomach pain, bloating, like within a couple of hours of eating gluten, they're down. They're really, really sick. And that can last two to three days for some people. That can be a really very, very nasty reaction. However, 60 percent of people with celiac disease will feel fine when they eat gluten or they won't really notice anything. Um, however, whether you feel sick when you eat gluten or you feel OK when you eat gluten, you're still having the same gut damage. The same long term damage is still happening. So if you were to sort of take a camera and have a look if what's going on on the inside is the same, whether you feel sick or not. And the reason that there's a difference is that celiac disease is a genetic disease. But there's a little bit of variation in the particular genes around celiac disease. And looking at the research, it looks like that if you have one particular variation, you get the vomiting version. And if you have the other variation, you have the not vomiting version. But the internal damage is the same. So this is where sometimes people say to me, well, you know, I'm only slightly celiac. Um, and I'd always say that's like telling me you're slightly pregnant. So you really are either celiac or you're not. And if you're celiac, you do have to avoid all of the gluten all of the time. So I'm, I'm sorry about you for that. Um, I wish there was a thing of being slightly celiac, but at, at the moment, the, the research is, is telling us that you still need to be just as strict with the gluten. Myth number 10 is spelt is gluten free. And this one is still going. I still see this on Facebook posts and things like that. So I see lots of people pushing foods as being gluten free that are not. So one is that um, the idea, as I said, spelt is gluten free. Spelt is just another name for wheat. It's a fashionable name for wheat. So we see spelt bread all over the place. Spelt has absolutely loads of gluten in it. So does kamut, which is just another type of wheat as well. Um, sourdough bread, I, you know, I had a lovely conversation with someone recently and they genuinely believed that if you made the, the flour with sourdough, that it took the gluten out of the bread. So it absolutely doesn't. Um, the only sourdough bread that's going to be gluten free is if it's made with gluten free ingredients. So ordinary sourdough bread, the gluten is not removed in the sourdough process. Couscous is also full of gluten. Couscous is actually a type of pasta. And most people think it's like a, a different grain on its own. So I, lots of people I'd meet with celiac disease and they're still eating away on their couscous because they haven't realized that actually it's, it's wheat again. And semolina is wheat as well. So another one just to watch. So they're the 10 myths I wanted to go through with you, but I wanted to also talk about a condition called non-celiac gluten intolerance. And this is where someone is having a reaction to gluten, but they're not celiac. So when we test them for celiac disease, they're negative, even if they're eating gluten, they're negative. Um, but when they eat gluten, they have um, quite a reaction to it. And estimates now are a little all over the place with this one, but the estimate is around 400,000 people in Ireland might be gluten intolerant. So, what you need to do if you think you might be gluten intolerant, the, as I said, keep eating gluten. You have to rule out celiac disease. So keep eating your gluten, get your celiac test done. Um, and that, in that case, even if the blood test is negative, it might be a time to have the biopsy done just to really rule it out if you, if you know you're reacting when you eat gluten. You also have to rule out wheat allergy. So you can have, wheat is a funny thing. There's three things in it that really bother people's digestive systems. One is gluten, if you're celiac or non-celiac gluten intolerant. Another is um, the wheat, a different wheat protein that you can actually have a wheat allergy to. And the third one is a type of carbohydrate in wheat, which is called fructan. 
And a lot of people who are fructan intolerant will get bloating and constipation when they eat it. So it's very important to figure out which bit of the wheat is actually the problem. So if you're someone who gets a lot of bloating or you have a lot of tummy issues, but when you cut out um, the wheat, you feel brilliant. So we go, okay, is it the gluten? Is it a wheat allergy? Or is it the fructan? So you need to rule out all of those. And really, once you've ruled out celiac disease, ruled out that it's a wheat allergy, and that's a test to do with your GP. It's an IgE wheat, um, IgE for wheat test that your GP can do, um, or you can do skin prick tests. Um, and then a dietitian will be able to help you look and see if fructan might be the issue um, for that. And if you've ruled all of those out and it's none of those things and your, your doctor's checked you out for anything else that might be causing the problem, um, then you could look at gluten actually being the issue. And we would definitely see people where when they eat gluten are having um, the symptoms. What's different is that people with non-celiac gluten intolerance tend not to get the, the vitamin and mineral deficiencies. So there's no actual damage to the lining of the bowel in the sense that it's not damaged and people still absorb their nutrition, even though there's other reactions that's making them feel sick. So we do support people at the Celiac Society who have non-celiac gluten intolerance. We definitely have more and more people who are recognizing that that's what's going on with them. And they do need that strict gluten-free diet as well. So as a society, we're kind of here definitely for our celiacs, but also anyone who needs to live gluten-free and we have support um, for people with that as well. So in summary, we know that up to 40% of celiac symptoms are outside of the gut. And some people are totally silent in terms of symptoms and they're only picked up because their iron was low or they had a blood test and their B12 was low or something like that. Many people have few to no gut symptoms. So consider celiac disease if someone has sort of early onset osteoporosis or osteopenia. Think about it if someone has fertility issues. We know that 6% of couples who are experienced fertility issues, one or both of them will turn out to have celiac disease and that that's actually the problem. Late onset of periods for girls, early menopause for women, recurrent mouth ulcers, iron deficiency, anemia, and if any family members. So it's one in 10. If So if you have celiac disease, your parents, your siblings, your children should all be checked. With cousins, it's one in 20. So we don't necessarily say you'd have to get checked if you have a cousin with celiac disease. But if you have a cousin with celiac disease and you're having all kinds of tummy symptoms, I would definitely be checking out um, celiac disease with that. We know that it takes up to 10 years for a patient with celiac disease to be diagnosed in Ireland. We know data from the UK would say that it takes up to 14 years in the UK to be diagnosed. So it takes a long time sometimes for people to put the symptoms together from the first, and that's from the first time they go to their GP. It's not even just the first time that they have symptoms. Um, but it can take a long time for someone to think, could it actually be celiac disease? So I suppose the big message we want to send out here is think celiac. If you have something going on, especially if it's got related, think celiac, at least rule it out and make sure that that's not your issue. So just coming to the end, um, with the Celiac Society, we provide huge support for people who need to live gluten-free. So we have our food list that we update every year, and that looks at foods that are made with ingredients that are gluten-free, but also we check what's going on in manufacture. Is there cross-contamination? And um, remember this 20 parts per million we need to be careful of. So we talk to just loads of food manufacturers every year. We have our app as well at the moment, so you can use that to scan barcodes and help you to choose foods that are gluten-free. We provide lots of help and support. Um, I'm here um, at the end of a phone line. Frances, who's our chef and our food technologist, is there as well. And she does lots of work. We have loads. We have our membership support um, for people who are newly diagnosed, but also people who've been celiac for a while. We run the dietitian clinics. Every year we have our Minding Me Gluten Free course. It's just coming to the end this week. And that's a whole system of just support about health. Um, not just for to do with um, celiac disease, but really just the whole, the whole holistic approach to it. Um, celiac Awareness Week will be coming up again in May. And, you know, there's lots of benefits with it. So do join us today and do follow us on Instagram at Celiac Ireland. So thank you all very much for joining today. And thank you to Shar who has sponsored this session for us. Um, I'm going to check now and see if anybody has any questions. Um, and we will go on from there. No, I don't know if anybody has any questions or anything they want to ask me. Let's have a look. I think we have a few there. Yeah. Wow, loads of questions. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm going to just go down through these. Give me one second. 
Now, is there a specific amount of gluten that needs to be consumed during the gluten challenge? Um, we could do with a lot more research on that, that's for sure. So um, what we would like is, um, we would recommend at the moment that you're eating gluten at at least two meals a day. So, you know, like something like sort of two wheat bix for breakfast, two slices of bread at lunchtime. So it's quite a big amount because what you want to make sure is you've plenty of gluten in there so that any reaction that's happening does actually show up. And um, if a patient was advised was avoiding gluten when taking the biopsy, could the result of the biopsy be false? Yes, definitely. And it's a big problem. So if you go for a celiac biopsy, um, now it, it, you can get a false negative. So if you were only recently off gluten and you go for the biopsy, sometimes the damage will still be in the gut because it can take a while to heal. Um, but if you've been off gluten and you get a negative biopsy, it kind of tells you nothing. Um, it means there's nothing else going on, but you could still be celiac. So that's why it's really, really important to keep eating um, your gluten, even if you are celiac. What's the first blood test to do to rule out um, celiac disease? Is it IgA and what are normal levels? So the first test that we would look at, there's a few tests your GP will do at the same time. So you would look at an IgA for what we call a TTG, which is a tissue transglutaminase. And that lets us know if your body is reacting to gluten. At the same time, your doctor will check a couple of other blood tests because there's a few that we need to do all together with it. But your first one is that IgA TTG, um, which is a bit of a mouthful. Um, how many people with gluten intolerance also have issues with oats? Um, and that's a really good question because with gluten intolerance, and I'm going to just talk about that separate to celiac disease, we don't have a huge amount of research on it. So my answer to that is I don't know. But I would think that if someone has non-celiac gluten intolerance and they are reacting to gluten, I would expect that they would need um, gluten-free oats anyway. It, with someone with celiac disease, though, about 5% of people with celiac disease will react to a different protein in oats called avenin. So that would be something, you know, often what I'd see in the clinic is people who might be celiac for a while, they're on a gluten-free diet, they come into me because they're still having tummy trouble. Now, the first thing we'll always do is go very thoroughly through the diet and make sure they're definitely um, gluten-free. Um, but after that, one of the things we might take a look at is just taking oats out of the diet altogether um, for a while. Um, just to see with that. So about 5% of people we'd see would have that reaction with it. Um, at what age should my child be tested? So if you are a parent with celiac disease, um, now again, we don't have set guidelines on it, but a couple of studies now would say that if your child is symptom-free, you should check them at age three, age six, and age nine. And usually at that stage, it, it looks like they're okay, but not, not always. If they are symptomatic, then you would test them um, straight away, regardless of what age they are. Just remember that the blood test is not reliable in children under three. Um, so it might just need to be that you go in and have a chat with your doctor about that. Um, let's have a look. My son is 12. He was tested at four or five years of age. Result was negative. He complains on and off about his stomach. It seems identical to how I feel, but if it's been kind of about five or six years since he was tested, um, I would pop back into the GP and just have a look. I mean, he, he shouldn't have constant pains in his tummy. So even if he turns out he's not celiac, I'd be having a look at just following up to see what's going on there. And um, sometimes in children, obviously, I, I, I don't know your child at all, but sometimes kids can be constipated and that can give them um, pains in their tummy as well. So it might not be celiac, but just when it's in the family, I'd be inclined to just rule it out again. And just as I said, make sure, particularly at 12, when he's heading into that really rapid growing period um, as a teenager, um, no harm just to get that checked again. Can you have problems with all grains? Um, you can, and the, uh, at this stage, I always say the human body is amazing in what it can react to. So I, I would rule out nothing, um, but some grains will have fructans in them. Some will have other proteins. So generally with celiac disease, it's wheat, rye, and barley. That's the issue. And as I said, some people, um, it can be oats as well, but um, it's unusual to be reacting to every single grain that's out there, but some people do. Some people just have a very, very sensitive system with that. Um, my TTG levels have never fallen below 10. Um, sorry, now that has jumped on me. Um, fallen below 10 over 10 years. Um, recent biopsies show everything is fine. Is this something to be concerned about? To be honest, the biopsy is your kind of gold standard. If your gut is looking beautiful and healthy, um, you know, I, and I wouldn't be too worried about it. You could have a look, maybe you're oat sensitive with that um, and maybe removing oats give, you know, for about three months and just see, does that make any difference to it? But as I said, the biopsy this is always the one that I would go by. If you have the biopsy, that's the big one to have a look at. Um, when I was diagnosed with celiac disease endoscopy, I was told by my consultant to avoid all oats, even gluten-free oats. 
and that there was no going back on it ever. So the advice on oaths um, literally changes about every three years. Now, for the last sort of three years, it has been consistent that an adults continue to eat oats um, and only take them out later if you think there's a problem. But there's definitely a little bit of disagreement about it. Some people really don't think any oats should be in there at all. But we have lots and lots of people who are eating oats and the biopsies are coming back fine. The TTGs are coming back fine. We're not seeing any particular issue around extra osteoporosis or anything with it. So, um, you know, it's certainly up to you what way you to, to have a look at that with it. As I said, the guidance at the moment for adults is continue to eat oats and we only take them out if you're feeling sick or your TTG levels are not coming um, down again. Um, liver enzymes are still high after one year being gluten-free. Is this normal or anything to be concerned about? Again, we don't have enough research to say for definite that happens. Um, what we do know is it's not unusual to have high liver enzymes when you're diagnosed with celiac disease. They typically do come back down. Um, but to be honest, I'd say to you, pop back into your GP and just have a discussion there because I, I don't have your full medical history to know what else might be going on. So that's definitely a question to talk to your GP about. Now, I think that is all of our questions for today. Um, so look, thank you to everybody for coming along and joining. Um, I don't know if anyone has any last questions that they might want to, to have a look. Or if you're, if you're feeling brave and you just want to talk, you can do that. Um, Oh, hang on. There's a couple more just come in. Um, my daughter was diagnosed celiac at 12 years. Should she have an annual blood test? Yes, definitely. Um, so all celiacs once a year, you're going to get your TTGs, your iron, you're going to get your folic acid and your vitamin B12 checked. And you're going to get your, um, I was going to say, you're going to get your, yeah, it's gone out of my head, <laughs> thyroid, thyroid checked. Yes, definitely. Um, if I'm following a gluten-free diet and symptom-free, what checkup should be, I be having? Exactly that, um, your, your iron, your folate, those annual blood tests. If you're diagnosed with celiac disease as an adult, you should also have a bone scan and a de or a DEXA scan. Really important to check where your bones are once you're diagnosed. Like even if you're 22 when you're diagnosed, you still need to have your bone scan done um, and just do that. Is there a way to find out if you have intolerances other than gluten? Um, the only way is to talk to a core registered dietitian. Um, and get her to have a look at your diet and look at your symptoms. So if you go to someone who's experienced in gut health, um, they'll be experienced with things like a lactose-free diet, a low FODMAP diet, and really will just give you some great advice around that. Um, if, you're, if you're having symptoms, that's a good way to go. Um, now, I think I jumped there a minute, but I think I have all of the questions in there. And I think that's everything. Oh, hang on. Um, all right. Brilliant. OK, well, look, I think we leave it there. Thank you very much for everybody to come. It's great to see so many of you um, joining us here today. Um, do let us know if there's any other topics for webinars that you would like. Um, you know, we're, we're putting out topics we think people might be interested in, but there's a particular area and it doesn't necessarily have to be celiac disease. If it's anything to do with health, come back to us um, and we will look at that and certainly get in touch. Do follow us on Instagram at Celiac Ireland. And if you're not a member and you're celiac, do join us. Um, we have great support for members and, you know, we always love to have more people on board. And if you're out around Clondalkin, we have our new offices in Clondalkin and we have a shop at the front with some um, hard to find gluten free foods in there. So if you're passing, come in and have a look or come in and say hello. There's somebody there every single day and we'd only be delighted to see you pop in. So we look forward to seeing you at our next webinar, which has been a couple of weeks. So do look out for that coming into your inbox and it'll also be up on the Celiac Ireland or the celiac.ie website um, and do check us out there. So I hope you have a lovely day. Take care.